We're back, we're live, we're here with Midnight in Brussels, actually a special edition of Midnight in Brussels. Gauri Kondekar, our correspondent in Brussels, joins us. It's, what is it, 11 o'clock at night um, on a given Monday. Uh, she is with Global Relations Forum, that's her think tank uh, in Brussels. Welcome again back to the show, Gauri. Thanks so much, Jay. It's always a pleasure. It's great to have you on the show. Keep us current. Teach us about Europe. We need to know more about Europe. Hawaii is so far away and it's out of sight, out of mind, but we need to know about it. <laughs> so there are, what are we calling this show? The news in Europe. One headline after another. Been pretty active lately, eh? Yes, uh, for all the wrong reasons, actually. But uh, yes, I have to say events on the 15th and 16th, and then again, they've just not stopped. Uh, it's, uh, it's been chaos a bit. Well, let's unpack that. So. The, the thing that comes to mind is Bastille Day in Nice. What happened? And, uh, what, you know, what, what do you make of it? Well, I think as uh, almost everybody knows, it was Bastille Day celebrations uh, in Nice on the uh, seafront. Uh, and there's an area, it's the walk called the Promenade des Anglais. Um, and uh, a terrorist, and we'll come to that uh, about his character later, but he drove a pickup truck the, one of the biggest pickup trucks there are, uh, rammed it into people and mowed around uh, 200 people or, or more, killing 84 uh, for now because there are some people who are still critical and injuring more than 200. And it was really the most shocking incidents uh, because it unveiled quite a few new uh, tactics, uh, but also the people that have been killed on, on such a uh, happy day. Yeah, it's almost like a competition, you know, each one of these guys wants to kill more than the previous guy, make himself famous. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, um, the thing about uh, Mohamed Boule, uh, who was the terrorist, uh, is he wasn't, um, uh, he, was, he was known by the police for petty crimes, uh, but he wasn't a known terrorist. And it, was, it is now believed that he got radicalized very quickly. He was a divorced uh, a uh, single person uh, who um, who had said that he's, he was not very religious. He used to never go to the mosque. He was a salsa dancer, body, a bodybuilder. Uh, he used to drink. Uh, so his religious intonations are really not clear. Um, but he was self-radicalized, it seems. And uh, I think one of the main characteristics we notice is that it's a loss of purpose and uh, a will to do, to go from zero to hero in a way. Um, and so this they they, um, they pick up this ideology. They um, they assign themselves to it, and and they they create carnage uh, by which they feel they will be remembered in some way. Yeah. Well, the truck is a new strategy, isn't it? And it strikes me that um, we're going to see more trucks. Don't you think? I mean, ISIS had sent out this warning a few uh, or a call, let's say, a couple of uh, weeks ago, saying that fill petrol in your vehicles and go and mow down people. Uh, and it's really scary. I mean, I've seen videos of the Nice attack, the aftermath, uh, people lying on the ground, and it's so scary. I mean, we live in Europe, but, you know, when attacks happen uh, thousands of kilometers away or miles away, uh, you don't really feel the impact. But when you see the videos, you know it's real, you know. Um, and it just drives home that fact. Uh, you never know who's going to pick up which vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and, and any means are possible of mass killing, actually. Yeah. Well, you know what, uh, really, I wanted to ask you, uh, so you're, you know, you're quite a distance from Nice, and yes. yet it's, it's still Europe. Um, yes. And it's very, you know, inter it's, it's, you know, you're connected with the south of France. So how do people feel about this one? Um, is this getting to be business as usual, or are people more excited than they were before? Actually, I was in Nice last year for a friend's wedding. I have a friend who lives in Monaco and Nice. I mean, they're really close by. Uh, and she was in Nice at that time. Uh, and it's really a shocker because Nice is, uh, well, um, quite a well-off city. It's, um, it caters to the rich and famous mainly. Uh, and of course, those seeking vacationing spots in Europe. Um, lying on the French Riviera, it has a laid back attitude. Uh, and so this has been really something that's, um, that's, that's 
uh, there's been more than a shocker for Europe. It's been more than a wake up call in a way. And, uh, and, and people, I think, they don't know how to deal with it because they've had such a laid back attitude to life itself. Yeah, it's not one country, it's all countries. Your country could be next, you know, it could happen in your city. <laughs> <clears throat> we just got through it. So, yeah. just, you just had yeah. yours. Maybe you'll have a moment, you know, of respite before you have another one. But, you know, it certainly seems this is an ongoing thing. On the other hand, um, you know, this was special. This was iconic. It was Bastille Day. Bastille yes. Day is really important to the French. Yes. And, and of course, uh, the fireworks and all that make it a, a very sacred holiday for them. And, and Avenue des, des Anglais is the sacred place in uh, Nice. It's the center of Nice. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, yes. So this was iconically, this was very symbolic, this attack. Of course, and it's the, um, it's the day of French identity in a way, of liberty, uh, of independence, fraternity, uh, equality. But, you know, I mean, all these values aside, it's a, it's a national day. Um, this, was a, this was expected in a way, but not in Nice, you know. It's, um, the political capital, of course, is, is Paris. Uh, but but Nice is uh, is mo all the more shocking because it's it was not on the radar. I feel. Yeah. Well, that's the that's the scary part. Any place, any yeah. any time, anyhow. <laughs> so um, you know, uh, looking looking at it now, uh, you really wonder what's what's going to happen. The French uh, got pretty angry politically, and the, they said uh, Hollande said they were going to send ten thousand troops into the Middle East, try to you know deal with ISIS there. They beefed up security around the country. Um, is this, does this mean a degradation of uh, civil rights? Does it mean a, you know, a move to conservative and oppressive government? Well, the government itself is uh, in trouble. Um, it's not been very effective at preventing terrorism. Uh, and this is what Nicolas Sarkozy, the former president uh, and also leader of the opposition, has accused the government of doing. Uh, Francois Hollande, the French president, en enjoys a really um, limited uh, popularity amongst uh, the population. It's at the lowest of any president, <laughs> any French president. Mm. So that is quite something. Then you have the uh, growth of the far right movement under Marine Le Pen. Uh, she's a very controversial figure. She's been booked under also uh, racism, uh, intolerance, uh, anti-Semitism. So, um, politically, things are not stable in France. Uh, al although the government might want to show that they are tackling terrorism uh, to a certain extent at home, but also abroad, <laughs> um, won't help much until they consolidate what is to be done at home itself first, because the first response needs to be uh, domestic. Um, because the person, uh, the, the terrorist was domestic. He never even went to Syria. He's not been... Uh, uh, using the traditional radicalization platforms. Uh, so the domestic is really a bit of more soul searching that needs to be done by the French. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they got to do something. Uh, I think in the absence of some action, they'll just continue to have these attacks. All of Europe will. And it, it seems to define, uh, you know, at least a part of Europe's future now to have to deal with this. But let's, yeah. uh, let's move to another topic, okay? Um, I guess we should talk about the coup in Turkey. Uh, that was remarkable. What happened there? Well, um, all of a sudden, everybody was dealing with the aftermath of Nice, and then news about Turkey emerged. Um, I think it was the shortest coup possible, but I, we literally saw on Twitter um, the news erupting of a coup being declared by the armed personnel uh, in Turkey. The military had uh, <coughs> excuse me, had issued a, a message on TV declaring that it had taken over the country. And then we saw uh, tanks in, uh, in, in both Ankara and Istanbul, jets flying over, shutting off the TV stations. Um, and then immediately a few hours later, we saw Erdogan, the Turkish president, um, on, uh, on, on FaceTime speaking with an independent news channel, which Face is ironic time. because yes, <laughs> there have been quite a few jokes on that because he's been suppressing them for so long and he, he used their medium, you know, 
So he was an independent news channel. I think it was CNN Turkey. Uh, and, and he was speaking with them on FaceTime. And he called out to the public to come on the streets via that call. Surprisingly, people came, people mobilized very quickly, which is something I doubt uh, is, is uh, not, you know, uh, how did they come out so quickly in a way and how do they have access yeah. um, all to the televisions and all the internet services were, uh, sorry, the social media were closed. So the word spread out <laughs> rapidly. Uh, and the people came out, they defeated the army. Uh, mind you, is the second largest army in NATO. So oh. the people, a handful of people defeated them. And then Erdogan came there the next morning and said, uh, well, uh, it's over, you know, the coup has been suppressed. So, but, you know, for me, I have a feeling that this coup was really staged. Staged by Erdogan himself. And I'll give you a few reasons. Um, the coup lasted just six hours in a way. In six to seven hours maximum. Um, there were really few, quite just a few deaths rather than a lot of bloodshed which is not normal east of europe you know a coup is really bloody east of europe uh and yeah i would count turkey east of europe um the other thing is well they lost 250 250 people were killed yeah uh until yes now but early reports were 100 and then afterwards you know those were in execution as well um but it's still quite limited i mean if you see the coup in coups in thailand or also in pakistan there are thousands dead yes yes, um, yes. but then uh, erdogan's plane so he was coming to ankara and there were two f-16s which had him in view but didn't fire at him uh, and only half the military or, or part of the military had staged the coup apparently which would never happen in any military there's a line of control and command and unless the entire military is on board in a country like turkey they would not take the chances <laughs> But, you know, Erdogan has important discussions coming up with Israel and with Russia. So what, what, so what is it, are you suggesting that maybe Erdogan <laughs> set up the coup as a, for his own reasons? What, what would those reasons have been? <laughs> that, that's, um, that's my thinking. I, I still have this uh, <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> theory in mind. But, uh, but for a few reasons, I mean, it, it gives him an excuse to do what he's doing now, which uh, is establishing himself as the only person in power. Ah, uh, moving to the right, taking greater control of the country. Exactly. He's got the most, uh, he's, got the, he's got the best excuse. And he's not only persecuted the military personnel, but also 3,000 judges. So there was a joke I read this morning about The Economist with a person, a military man sitting in uh, prison with another guy, and he's saying, uh, oh, this is not fair, I need a human rights lawyer. And the other person is, well, you came to the right place. Which <laughs> 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 is so true. <laughs> At least there's some humor there. <laughs> he, he's jailed everyone, you know. And I think this is to, uh, he's always wanted to make the president's position stronger than the prime minister. Because earlier he was prime minister. Yeah. Now he wants to transfer it into a presidential system. Yeah. Uh, and second, I mean, other reasons are also because it strengthens his own position vis-a-vis -vis the EU, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Israel, because he has negotiations. And he portrays himself as the only man they need to speak to, having suppressed a coup in the second largest army in NATO. It makes him stronger at, yeah. at a time when he needs to be strong. He's got a lot of challenges right now, uh, right across the border from Syria. <laughs> I would say it's just foreign policy posturing in a way, but um, but yeah, I mean, with him, you never know. Yeah, yeah, he's really a sui generis. Uh, let's take a short break, uh, Kauri, and then we come back. I I like to talk about the fallout from uh, uh, Brexit. This, this is really full of headlines. I'd like to talk about the Asia Europe meeting in Mongolia, and if we have time, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, you know whether Europe cares about the Hague's decision over the South China Sea. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation Coming Soon. You can catch us live on thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. 
I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Hello, I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm the host of Global Connections. I'm also a professor at Hawaii Pacific University, and my show and some of the other things that we do is show soft the collaboration that we have between Think Tech Hawaii and Hawaii Pacific University. So I look forward to seeing you and talking with you about a lot of issues dealing with Hawaii, the United States, and the world. Thank you very much. Welcome to thinktechhawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. The topic is Asia and Reveal. We do it on a monthly basis on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Be sure to check the schedule. See you. <coughs> we're back. We're live with uh, Gary Kondekar. She joins us by Skype from Brussels. We call this midnight in Brussels, although it's a little earlier than that. We're talking about the news in Europe, one headline after another. OK, moving on um, to, let's see, what do we got? Uh, the Hague. Um, the Hague has a, ha made a ruling about the South China Sea yes. um, and ruled in favor of the Philippines, which I think in most people's view is the right thing, that China has no legitimate claim to uh, building Scarborough Island and otherwise taking control of that area. Um, th now, this happened in Europe. This decision was made in Europe. Uh, yes. What kind of reaction do we see in Europe? Uh, none. <laughs> China is too politically all too important and economically as well for Europe at the moment. So none. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Actually, it's the permanent arbitration court, which is nothing to do with the UN. Uh, it's, uh, it's a member's court, actually. Uh, and China has been calling this statement void, the ruling void, and it does not, uh, says that it does not accept it. Now, um, you know, you're, uh, China is Europe's second largest partner after the U.S. Uh, and trade figures are quite close. Uh, Investment-wise as well, Europe is looking for investment from China uh, for obvious reasons. Uh -huh. uh, China's One Belt, One Road will really benefit Europe. Yeah, so uh, people are not likely to take action against China about it. In uh, fact, I would say the same process that you describe in Europe is happening in the U.S., uh, you know, it's, it's uh, somebody else's backyard, not mine. <clears throat> and I think uh, if, if it, the only way to stop the Chinese on this move, this, this ter taking of territory, essentially, is, uh, is force. Um, but nobody is willing to even suggest that. So no, but also who is going to implement the decision? There's nobody, there's no global NATO. There's uh, no Southeast Asian army. So there's nobody who's going to implement that decision at all, except for putting pressure on China. And China doesn't really care about pressure. No. <laughs> and the Europeans won't even try. Yeah, and, and the stakes are high for China because it wants control of an area where three trillion tons of trade move every year. Uh, whereas strategically, from a military point of view, this is a critical piece of real estate. Yes. Um, and because this is a process they haven't done before, but which now they can do again with impunity. You'll see more of this, Gary, I guarantee it. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, what's surprising is that some countries in Asia uh, themselves are not supporting this, and they've, o they've opposed Philippines' decision to, to appeal to the court in the first place. So the countries like Malaysia as well, India, uh, and uh, Cambodia, which is, of course, curry flavored by China. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, most of these countries oppose it because they have their own crises. For example, India and Pakistan over Kashmir, yes? Uh, and what the court does is give a fait accompli, which is a, a, a decision that is to be, you know, a ready-made decision. You cannot appeal that decision. So there are some countries that don't want to already uh, ac acknowledge uh, the ruling in, in Asia itself. Uh, even though they might... Um, they might benefit from it. Yeah. But uh, this is the paradox of international politics. It is. One thing is clear, though. The, <clears throat> the boundaries are changing. The area, the area is changing. The power structure is changing. And from an international point of view, it seems like China is making headway every time you look. Not only you know, politically, militarily, and um, gee, uh, economically. Yeah, this is just a geoeconomic policy of Europe at the moment. I think it's a misguided policy because um, peace in the South China Sea 
is extremely vital because Europe has trade with South Korea and Japan. Um, so it's not only trade with China that counts. Uh, so Europe has all the more reasons. It's also trade with Southeast Asia that that is dependent on uh, on this sea. Um, so I think uh, geoeconomics aside, I think geopolitical considerations should also be borne into mind. A more united Europe uh, is required, but of course after Brexit, <laughs> that becomes all the more difficult. Yeah, well that, that takes us to our next subject. Right, let's take a moment and talk about uh, Brexit. Um, Theresa May, what do you think of her position? You're going to let it happen the way they voted? Uh, she's not looking for any revote or reconsideration. Uh, she's going to try to m make the best of a bad, a bad vote. Um, is that going to work? Well, Theresa May has been quite clear. So, uh, I must say, everybody has been surprised by her or taken aback by her, uh, in, not positively, <laughs> because they thought she would, since she was close to Cameron and she had uh, campaigned for the Remain vote, to remain in the EU, they thought she would somehow work it in a way that UK stays in the EU, but she's not done that. And there are two surprising <laughs> revelations because, first of all, uh, she's created a Brexit minister and they've set a date for Brexit to happen, which is the 1st of January 2019. By that date, the UK will be out of the EU. The second thing is she made Boris Johnson, so I think everybody knows a bit about Boris Johnson. Now he was the mayor of London, uh, the former mayor. And he campaigned quite strongly for Brexit. Uh, and he was also a good friend of David Cameron, the former prime minister. Uh, and he stabbed him in the back. <laughs> Which is, um, he was a quite a close friend. And she made uh, Boris Johnson, who is quite a controversial figure now in Europe, she made him the foreign minister. Yeah. And as foreign minister, he has a number of meetings and he's in Brussels today, actually. <laughs> Um, so these have been the two moves. Theresa May has been, uh, has taken a hard line on immigration as well. So about um, the people who would, uh, who ha uh, Europeans that are already in the UK, but also Europeans who would uh, come between now and the Brexit date. Uh, so she's been quite tough on immigration. She's been very adamant on, or she seems very adamant on Brexit. So there's no second thought there. Yeah. Um, I think she wants to appease the people uh, in view of the next elections. So yeah. that is her personal gains, uh, medium-term strategy. Well, can economically, you know, this is going to hurt Britain and it's going to hurt the EU too. But what, what role does uh, the U.S. have? I mean, can the U.S. help, uh, you know, soften the effect of Brexit on, on Britain? Well, the U.K. is going to uh, bear the brunt of it. It's already going through quite a difficult time economically. Um, Brexit has wiped out billions of the stock exchange of property prices. Uh, the euro is at its lowest, it's trending at uh, 120 per, uh, the pound, sorry. Time to at travel to Europe, eh? <clears throat> I should come to Europe immediately. Yes, you should really actually go to the UK because it's cheaper <laughs> <laughs> and then come to Brussels. But, uh, <laughs> But it's, uh, the pound has really lost its value. Um, I don't think there's anything the, UK, the U.S. could do at this point. I mean, the, uh, President Obama himself uh, was in London speaking to the public. I don't think you could do anything more. Um, in terms of what to do after Brexit, uh, I think um, the U.S. will have to strike its own special relationship with the EU itself. And I think Germany will be taking the role of special uh, partner uh, to the U.S. in the EU. Now, for taking over from the U.K., of course. And U.K.-U.S. relationship will, of course, be something a bit separate. But I think the U.K. will lose its value. Yeah. Gee, uh, really interesting. This is, this is um, uh, the implications are huge. They're still unfolding. We don't know yet. The next few months or year, we'll see more. What, two years, whatever it takes. And um, at the end of the day, it's not going to be a zero-sum game. At the end of the day, they're going to be big winners and big losers and maybe more losers than winners. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, one, one other point, if we could get to uh, a quick discussion of what happened in Mongolia. Was it yes. every, every several years there's a meeting between Europe uh, and Asia? This time it took place in Mongolia just a few days ago. 
Uh, what happened? Uh, why? What was the reason? What was the upshot? Well, there is um, a platform, an intergovernmental platform called ASEM, the Asia Europe meeting. Uh, this was the 20th anniversary of ASEM. Uh, and they were celebrating it with a summit. It's a biennial summit. Uh, it's an event which brought together around 34 leaders of uh, um, from Asia and Europe. The total membership of ASEM quickly is 53. Um, but 34 members had come to Mongolia and it was already Mongolia's largest international event in its contemporary history. So <laughs> it was quite a big deal for Mongolia. Now ASEM has been working over the years to try and bring Asia and Europe closer. It's a bit like uh, APEC for the US, uh, but not quite. <laughs> um, the thing about ASEM is now, today, um, it's more divided than ever. Asia is more divided and Europe is more divided. And that's my new piece, actually, what I've written about ASEM. Already, ASEM lacks visibility uh, and it does not have many tangible outputs. But today's geopolitical situation with the crises Europe has faced, uh, and Brexit, of course, uh, and the far-right movements that are gaining space in, in Europe, but also what's happening in Asia with India and Pakistan, uh, China, but also the other fights between China and Japan, Japan, South Korea. Uh, and this has all created so many divisions within ASEM uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, unprecedented in a way. So as a forum which does not have a secretariat, which does not have many tangible outputs, it's already a difficult task. So going into its third decade, uh, I think ASEM has many challenges to face. <laughs> oh, Gauri, it, it all sounds like, um, you know, the world as we see it evolving these days is evolving into greater fragmentation here, mm -hmm. there, and really everywhere. And wait till you see the Republican um, National Convention which is yeah. happening today, tomorrow, you'll see. Now, that'll be a study in fragmentation, too. Some people yeah. say it's going to implode uh, the Republican oh. Party. I'm sure Europe will be watching. <laughs> but I would like to see your, um, I would like to see your piece. Uh, when, you, when you finish uh, writing your piece on fragmentation, I would certainly, I would appreciate if you'd send it to me, and I'll, if you don't of mind, course. I'll send it around, too. <laughs> Fantastic, I'll do that. Thank you very much, very grateful. Thank you, Gary. Gary Kandekar, Kandekar, Global Relations Forum, joining us by Skype, uh, as she does every few weeks, on midnight in Brussels. Today we're talking about the news in Europe. Um, the headlines are, are after one headline after another. We'll be back with more headlines next time. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Jay. Hello.